I love you. Thank you for joining another Zoom. We are talking to a young man. I say that facetiously. You'll find out in a little while. But it is a honor, uh, a double honor to have this this man with me. It's John M. Perkins. Uh, he is the founder and president and emeritus of John and Vera Perkins Foundation and co-founder of Christian Community Development Association. He has served in advisory roles under five U.S. presidents. He is one of the leading evangelical voices to come out of the American Civil Rights Movement. And he is the author of, author and international speaker of issues on reconciliation, leadership, and community development. For his timeless work, he has received 16 honorary doctorates. Let me welcome to our audience, John M. Perkins, and he gave me the permission to call him John. Welcome. It's, it's a real joy to be with you, brother, and to have this frank, good conversation together, especially at this time in the history of our nation. And this is the, the timing is perfect. And let me just also give a little shout out to Count It All Joy. And this is an easy read, but let me tell you, it is a wonderful read. It is intellectual, but simple. It is informative, but you'll understand everything you're reading. It is well done. And I read a lot of books, have a lot of guests. This is on the A-list. So make sure you go to the information that you'll see on the screen while John and I are talking and write it down because you're going to want this uh, information. Let me start out by saying, and by the way, Vera May is your wife? Vera May is my wife for 71 years. We've been married. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> Congratulations. Yes, yes, yes. And Thank you. you. And, and you're going to be 92 your next birthday. June 16th of this coming year. Wow. Now I'm going to I'm going to cover some things, and you can in, information that maybe I don't have. You can add to it. But you were born a poor black. You were born of a poor black woman in the Jim Crow era, and you lost your brother, two sons, and you and you were tortured, and you had cancer more than one time. So you have gone through. A life many of us will never see or experience. What has that given you? I it has enriched my life, I think, in terms of determination and a sense of God's love and his forgiven grace because I have sinned all the way through that and I have to even keep confessing my sins every day. So to a great degree, it has taught me a little about forgiveness and about the work of repentance in one's life. John, do you do you uh, so it has enriched my life at, at some key places? I think it has called me to want to endure because every time I am able to go through one of these, it creates a greater sense of dependence upon the giver of life. Wow. John, and let me said, ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Do you see racism in 2021? You know, I have stopped using the word racism sort of like we've been using in the past because I think it's too big an error for 
for God to bless it. I think it's too big a lie for God to bless. It's not racial reconciliation. That's a creative creation to release into our society what makes sin. Sin is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. When that comes together, it's sin. And that has come together. And it's not a, a racial problem because there's only one human race. And in the strong dictionary, Christian dictionary, there is no word uh, uh, for God that as it relates to race that is not singular. Right. God don't didn't make more than one human race, and he's not making that mistake. And <laughs> and that's where his love is seen at. Love one another for lovers of God. For God's so love, that was the first thought. Uh, 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 that is the summa thought of God that he created us to be one, that you might be one. But only love can make that oneness. And so he said, Absolutely on target. John, can yes. you hear me? Yes. Let me ask you a question. Did you experience growing up bitterness toward the white race? Uh, I, I, and not early on, because when my mother, my grandmother, who raised me after seven months old, a white gentleman came to law and told her if she, if, because he found some whiskey in our house, we were vote luggers and gamblers. So he came to the right place and he found some. But my grandmother said she was there, an old lady, taking care of us children. And she said to the sheriff in Mississippi, if I was a man, I would kick your behind for even thinking the thought that I'm going to freely go to jail with you, my job, and leave these children here. He did something that don't happen to many Blacks early on. He affirmed my dignity. Wow. By my grandmother telling me that she would kick a white man's ass <laughs> if he thought, I'm going to lead these children. Yeah. So what I had to do is learn how to uh, hate white folk because I already felt as good as them, I sort of felt a little bit better than them. And that don't really happen. Yeah. The white folks sold black folks on separate can be equal. Yeah. That's an oxymoron <laughs> many times over. And so you are black, you're supposed to hate yourself instead of loving God and loving yourself equal to that, and then loving you too. So that's the oxymoron. Do, do you, John, do you, do, you, do you think the, the bitterness in the races today is taught in the school rather than allowing them to determine like you did by the ones around them and liking them and not looking at the color of the skin? Yes, yes, and 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 that's dangerous right now. That's dangerous because there are some people who come here from other uh, nations who who don't believe they are minority. It's only heavily. It's heavily in Africa, but it's heavily here is that uh, black folks was pushed on them self hatred. And that the solution was that if you can integrate the white folks, it's going to make you eat up. That has been tried and it has failed. That's what integration was. It was that time when the last white moved out of the community and the first black moved in. 
We don't quite like each other based on the fact of how we have treated each other and that we have made it racially. God didn't make that. We made that up. We created a story where Noah was a white man, had three sons, and one of them, a grandson, looked at his uh, looked at his father unclothed, and it turned him black. And he's supposed to now serve his two other brothers who are white. And then I um, put that in the Bible and made some white folk believe that, and yeah. a lot of black folk. Yeah. So we have to get mad with you first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got to get mad with each other first. And the Bible said the first thing we'll do is love one another. Yeah. Love is a God. He let me, let me, let me ask God. you, let me ask you a question on your first chapter. The heading is chosen to suffer. Chapter one, do you think you were chosen to suffer? I, th I think that that happened when my mother, uh, when I when they cut this cut the uh, the, the, the 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 card, I cried. The mother was already crying. Yes, yeah. Uh, so all this racist stuff have to be learned, and so what we've been taught is a lie because of the lust of the flesh the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. When that come together, that's sin. And that, boy, we are close to Armageddon. We are moving closer to Armageddon because we don't like the minorities. What have the minorities did to us? We hate the white, we hate the black, now we hate the minorities, and people who are not white uh, are not black come to this country, they don't believe they are minorities. Right. So why do we hate them? Minorities build this wonderful country. We brag about that. The ethnicities came here. The Irishmans came here. The groups came here. They brought us here on the boat because this was after them convincing Noah that is something wrong with his son way back there. It's been a long time for that. Yeah. And when Columbus got here, uh, his boat or the boat after him had some blacks on it. And now we are talking about making America white again. Do you hear me? Yeah. We are talking some, some, we've got to learn how to talk love. We've got to learn how to speak love to each other. Uh, I'm glad I can love you. I'm 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 absolutely proud that I can love you. I don't have no trouble with loving a white. I don't have. And, no and I want you to know I have no trouble loving you. I know that. <laughs> I know that. I believe it. That's why we can have this conversation. The, the only, only thing the only thing I miss is I can't give you a hug. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I don't need your hug right now. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a few minutes. <laughs> let, let, let me also thank you for serving in our armed forces. You served in the Korean War. Right. I did. I did. And, and I'm, I'm glad I did. I, I, I love this nation. The Declaration of Independent Thought is the greatest, one of the greatest extracts in order than any other passage in the scripture. Uh, uh, the, the idea of we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all humankind was created equal and was endowed by their creator with certain rights, chief among those are life, and life is the summa of man gift from God. I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. We don't like that now. We can go into the Capitol and with a Newton rope to kill the vice president and that can still be constitutional. 
is something wrong with our thinking. We have got our political ideology above the Bible, and we're still trying to call ourselves Christians. Yes, yes. I'd rather have the Bible. It tells us to love each other, and it tells us how to do that. Love God first, and love yourself second, and then love your neighbor third, but you love them equally. Yes. You have it. You have in this book also blessing for obedience, punishment for sin. Well, I didn't get that one. These are your words: <laughs> blessing <laughs> for obedience, punishment for sin. You talk about, but be careful that when somebody is suffering, you think they are living in sin, but that's why they're suffering. Be careful of thinking that way. Oh, yeah, and, and that's the story in there, is Job. Job ain't no, didn't know nothing about that conversation. That wasn't a conversation between uh, Job and God. That was a conversation against the fallen creature, whoever he was, was Satan. Job know nothing about that. So Job was divine the call to suffer the way he suffered. He was rewarded for that by getting whatever he needed and more of it in a family. So God was testing Job uh, in terms of his love for him. Amen. Is that, that was a test. And that's what suffering is. Suffering is a discipleship. That's what repentance is all about. You got to identify with your hurting of others. And that's what makes us repent and confess our sin. That's good news of great joy for all people. That is the gospel in its fullness when we repent and turn to this God of love. We become born afresh again, not of the water, but we've been born of God, the Spirit of God. Oh, Lord, we have a great book here in the Bible, but, but, but man today seems to love a lie better than the truth, and it says something like that because we are stuck, and I'm stuck with the lust of the flesh. It, it's, it's nowhere in the Bible. It teaches you that that lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, is 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 going away. Wow! When it is conceived, and that's why we got to love God hard on. Let, let's let's talk. Love God hard on. Let's talk about chapter three, tested by suffering. Yes. Do do yes. we do we learn from it? Are we brought closer to the suffering of Christ when we're going through it? What is the what is the outlook that you have derived from the Word of God? Really, God loves me. He said that to Paul on that, a mad man on the Damascus Road. I'm going to show you how much you're going to suffer. And Paul showed us his deep love. And he said it in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith and the grace of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. That was a blindness that was okay with Paul on the Damascus Road. It was okay when he went to Damascus and went to went to Macedonia and they jailed and beat him up. But when the jailer heard about this Christ, he said, how can I be like y'all? And Paul said, we got to wash each other's wounds. That's what you and I are doing. You are washing a uh, wound. In fact, you are a substitute for some of your other white folks. And I'm substituting for some of my 
other mean black folks. We are trying to make this kind of sacrifice, this necessary that our eyes can be open and that we can love one another. You talk so about- suffering is a paradox, and that's what makes the book so beautiful. Yeah, it is. It, 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 put is, Job it is, in there it is an as, easy read. Yes. Uh, you, you, talk, you talk about two gardens, Garden of Eden, Garden of Gethsemane. The, the Garden of Gethsemane made it real uh, with everyone. The three couldn't stay awake themselves while he endured uh, a prelude of what went ahead of the cross. It, the act of suffering, the act of suffering, but his thought of the cross, because he even asked the father, uh, did he have any other solution outside his pain he had to him? And he said, oh, I forgot something, Father. That's why you sent me. And we look more like God when we accept his pain. Wow. And especially when we accept that pain for others. For others. We're not here just for ourselves today. We're not here to, to experience the ideas of this suffering. We're there because black folk are killing a whole lot of black folks in my community. And 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 white folk was ready to take over the capital there. So we need to be suffering for each other. And you know you're already suffering. And I know that. The reason we're here today, we're trying to bear some of this pain. We, we're trying to show that it's possible for a white man and a black man to come together and talk about love. Amen. And, and talk about it. And, it and, and talk about it. Yes. You talk about in chapter five of this book, uh, the case for suffering. What is the case? What is it? The case for suffering, chapter five. The, the case, yeah, I hear you. The case for suffering is an unending case. It is, we, uh, it makes us more like Jesus. He came to suffer. He suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's gonna, he demonstrated his suffering there, but he made it real at the cross. Amen. Because he gave his life and the life of the flesh is in the blood, is in the blood. So so the case, but we keep asking it in life. We It's a question, why God, why? Why God, why? You know, and it's okay to ask why. Yeah, it's okay to ask why. I did you, did you, a- did you ask why when you went through two cancers and, and the life that you've lived these 91 years, did you ask why? Yeah, I tell you when I asked why, when I was tortured in the Brandon jail and was really tortured almost to the place of death. When they first, when I realized and thought that they was going to kill me, uh, I, 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 I went to God and Lord, I said, if I had a uh, an atomic grenade, I would pull it. It would kill these 18 or 20 highway patrols, but it would also t- kill those young people who was in jail with me. Then I saw that I was a bad man. So I didn't, I went too hasty. I didn't have the love of God. And this is what I said to God. I said to God, I know I was sprayed. I know I was bargaining with him. I I know I wasn't honest. But I said to God, something that was honest. I said, if I could get out of this jail tonight, 
alive. If you let me out of this jail tonight, lie. I want to preach a gospel. Wow. That's the love of God. Wow. I want to preach a gospel that can save us together. I saw their evil. I was looking white evil in the eyes. And then I realized that I had evil in my life for both blacks and white. And so when I said that, I realized that I had gone too far. Wow. I said, Lord, if you let me out of here, I'm going to preach a gospel Amen. in which we can love you together. When I got out of jail, I didn't want to see no white folks. That's the only way I didn't, wouldn't have to love them. I didn't want to see no white folks. But when the doctor was give, doing surgery on me, when the doctor was trying to keep me well and alive, it was a white doctor and a black doctor. But my real doctor who was in the room with him was a white uh, Catholic nurse, but she was a doctor. Some of the doctors, when I got operated on, would come and sit with me at night just to be with me when the pain was in. I was out loved by those people. They outlove me. That black doctor, that white doctor who ripped my stomach open, they outlove me. That's what we got to do it together. Amen. Amen. Love has got to be the love one another. <laughs> love, uh, loving ourselves can go to extreme. We can't take uh, 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 all our attention to ourselves. Yes, we got we have, we're we're out of time, John. John, we're out of time. Yeah. We had thirty minutes together, but what you've said, John three sixteen says it all. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what you have done. That's what I have done. And the audience that we have today, all they have to do is to call on the Lord Jesus Christ, invite him to take over their life, and he will come in. John, thank you for honoring me this day. Thank you for what you do and what you have done. You have blessed my life and our audience today. You have blessed immensely. Love you. God bless. Love you. Love you, brother.